Okay, so are we still waiting for G? Yeah, but he's not showing up, so I don't know. I don't know. I thought I was the late one. I'm glad that, well, I feel a little bit bad, but okay. Um, you're in your dungeon, I see. Okay, so, well, we wanted to, well, first of all, thanks thanks for doing all the work on the, on the Linux. That's pretty good. Um, so I look forward to the release finally pretty soon. We'll, yeah, we'll get yeah, there. Yeah. Um, I think regarding timing, I mean, the main, so September, I'm just going to this weekend post an announcement for a September Steam Camp. So that's what's going to go on. Uh, so we want to have that definitely for that, which would be um, sept starting September 19th. Okay. So we've got, as far as, um, ideally, uh, we would publish within two weeks such that I'm act actually shipping a copy of the Linux out to people as well. Okay. Um, okay. I, I, I think, think that's... Um, I, I think we're pretty much there. Yeah. Um, I, so I've, I've been going through and adding the stuff that I've learned about from your recent interactions with some other community members. And uh, so I'm trying to get the, uh, I believe I got the OBS uh, virtual cam thing set up so that we can use OB, do OBS via yeah. all these, these communication tools. Um, I'm also, I, I'm, the last thing I'm doing is ink, the ink cut plugin for Inkscape. That's okay. literally the last thing that I, I have not, uh, finished. So ink cut, is that the re from a recent discussion? Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I have, um, a With big list yeah. that's yeah. all literally in the last month. Or last mm -hmm. two weeks, I should say. Um, hello. Hello, G. Can't hear you. So. Can you hear me now? Yep. Got it. Hey. All right. Hi, nice to meet you. I've been looking at your GitHub. Awesome. <laughs> you must be Ray. Yes. Yes. So um, I actually I was just talking about the latest additions I've been making to the OSE Linux 2.0 image, and uh, so I've. Here's where I think I can get us. Um, I can pre-install Miniconda and have that ready to rock. I can pre-install the OSE Workbench platform itself, the, 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 the Git repo, a, a local clone of that. Um, but from there, I think the user is going to have to instantiate the virtual environment and go into it and, and do the stuff. You'd be correct, yeah. Is that is that acceptable? Yeah, no, yeah, that's that's what they're supposed to do. So, yeah, great. Yeah, so what I'm doing is getting the prerequisites there so that they don't have to worry about those. But then from there, they can follow your instructions in your Git in your GitHub. Excellent. Okay, perfect. And you can also alternatively uh, use Conda to install the platform itself because it's actually hosted on Anaconda Cloud. So um, there's like a Conda install command that you can run opposed to, you know, cloning the repository and having that local copy. Um, but the local copy would work as well. It's just an alternative to think about. Sure. What is the, uh, what exactly is the conda command that I would want to write right now? Um, yeah, it, it should just be conda space install space, and then you type, like, OSE workbench platform uh, with the, the dashes in there. Perfect. Let's see what happens here. And is this going to be a? Is this going to be a um, a system wide install, or is this a per user install? Once we're doing a Conda install, yeah. Um, I would imagine it's per user, but I'm not 100 percent positive on that. Okay, I actually got a, a package not available from current channels. Oh, okay. Um, there's one more command you got to run before that. So you have to add uh, the GB Rookus channel. I have to look up that command. I don't know it off the top of my head. If if you want uh, um, I I like the sound of, of installing it via the Conda. Um, if you want to uh, make a gist or add the add those commands to the to the README in your GitHub, I can I can run them from there. Uh, if you don't want to. Uh, want us to do this right now. 
Okay, yeah, there there actually is a command uh, in the README. If you go to installation, um, and it should have like the command syntax for specifying the channel that you need to find the package. Oh, I see. Conda create dash dash name OSDWD dash dash. Is that the thing you're talking about? Or no? Yeah, so, yeah. So that'll create a Iconda environment and install um, the platform. So you don't actually need to clone the repo at all. You just need to run that command. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's that's so much better. Because so again, that's really the point where I think the the end user is going to have to do that to have the best experience. So like that's a one-time command, and then you see that next command where it says uh, "conda activate OCWB." Yes, that's that's the one where the user is going to have to run like themselves. I understand. Well, I, I'm so what I'm proposing is that the user do, does both of those things themselves. The way, okay. Because the the way that I'm uh, creating this uh, US uh, OSD Linux 2.0 is that it will be a USB. Um, so when you're running in the live environment, it creates a, it's based on Linux Mint, so a, a user named Mint that's automatically has sudo, sudo access, and that's what you're going to use in the live environment. But then if you install this OSD Linux onto your own hard drive, it's going to prompt you for a username and create a new user for you at that time. So it gets kind of complex when it comes to doing things that are going to live in someone's home directory. I'm not that familiar with Conda. I've used other Python virtual environment tools like Pip, PipEnv and Poetry before, but not Conda. Okay, it's, it's pretty similar to like PipEnv. So it's going to install the package like within their home directory in some hidden folder. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe that approach is the, the best route then what you're proposing. Yeah, I have the ability to provision uh, home, the, the starting state of every new user's home folder. So I'm, I'm using an, on a Debian-based environment. It's directly called slash Etsy slash Skel, S-K-E-L. And that that is what every new user starts with. So I'm trying to put some configuration in there. But when it comes to actually like instantiating a virtual environment and then just having that sitting there and then everyone, it feels a little, it doesn't feel quite right to me. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Okay, great. I, I just want to make sure we're aligned on that. Then, yeah, sounds good. Then that then we're we're really good to go with that. I guess my other question is I'm looking at your JIT. The first other question I have for you G, is I'm looking at your GitHub and I see that uh, you also have a 3D printer workbench uh -huh. uh, available there. Um, so I is this an example of a workbench you've generated using the workbench platform? Correct. Yeah. And are there other workbenches that? So I want to pre-install as many FreeCAD workbenches as possible. Yeah, the 3D printer is the only one. Okay, great. So I, I know, I, I believe we have a piping workbench that's been around for quite a while. I, I have that one in there already. Okay. Um, and uh, I can go add this 3D printer workbench as well. Okay, awesome. Okay. Cause, yeah, I'm looking at the OSE ISO that's not listed. The 3D printer workbench is not listed in there. Is one of the benches yet? Okay, okay, I'll add that right now here. Great. Mm -hmm. When are you planning the release of OSC Linux two point oh? Uh, I think we're counting it in weeks at this point. Awesome. So, um, really, there's there's a few um, there's a a few software packages that I'm not that I was trying to add from what I've heard. I recently, when you uh, March, we had a meeting with um, a couple of back like live streaming ex. Yeah, yeah, with back. Yeah. And uh, he talked about a couple of like so I've added my paint. Because he mentioned liking to use that, I've, um, but he mentioned a couple of tools called OpenCast and OpenBoard, and I haven't been able to. So OpenCast to me seems more like it's supposed to run on a server, not on a workstation. Mm. 
but I may be mistaken about that. But right now, I'm not sure if I'll be able to include that. Um, and then open board as well. Um, I'm just, I, I'm trying to understand exactly what it is. But besides, <laughs> um, besides that, um, I should be see, able to see the link for open cast that I put in. Is that is that what you mean? I'm sorry. Say again. Look at the chat box there, and there's a, looks like a good intro video on that page with Fidel Castro. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah, I actually watched that already. Yes. Okay, I see. Okay. And, and what no, I don't worry about that. I think I think we're we're good. Um, I think OBS is our is our deal. That's um, we'll support a thing. Yeah, um, great. What what context did Beck bring up OpenCast in? I forget. I think I think he was just taught. It was just it, it got mentioned as one of the good open source tools for um, like broadcasting, running your own whole television channel sort of okay i think was kind of the level of the conversation at that time mm. how would that differ from something like voco screen is uh, it kind of the same idea or so uh we're talking about it something called yeah so i'm using multiple tools right so if you're used to voco screen voco screen will be there you can use it uh there's a kind of some new tools on the scene one is called uh obs studio uh, and that stands for Open Broadcaster Studio Studio. So um, that is used, that basically is used by live streamers on Twitch, like gamers that do live, like that's kind of the world that it came out of. And it, mm. it lets you run a software where you kind of have GIMP or Photoshop style control over different video sources. And uh -huh. you, okay, here's my video from my this camera, and then I can switch scenes to this other my using my phone as a camera external camera if I want with some additional massaging um, I can put a logo in the corner that's there I can maybe put a lower third effect if I want to make it look more like a professional television production um, and then allows you to output that either as a direct stream forms like twitch or using a plug-in treat that as a virtual camera using a Jitsi or a web a RTC or a Google Meet or Zoom mm -hmm. type of complex. That's really powerful, <laughs> like focus screen on steroids. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it because you can also <laughs> you could basically use your screen as a video source, and then like if you see those cool videos where you see that someone doing a screen share, but they're they're they there they are in the corner talking at the same time. You know, yeah, they're probably using OBS. Hmm. And Very then, cool. um, so also on the video, in the video world, like we have KDen Live for non-linear video editing, for yeah, post-production. And there's a newer player on the scene there called OpenShot. Uh, Is that open... any good at this point? I think so. I think the way, but I think what I would say is that I come, I do come from a Mac background, so I would say KDen Live is Final Cut Pro. Open shot is iMovie. Okay. So if you want to quickly um, edit together some clips, uh, Open Shot is uh, worth considering as well. Okay. Okay. And you're so including that, you're including Open Shot. Yes. And there, so yeah, uh, right now I, I guess it's we might as well talk and get it all out in the open. <laughs> I, I am uh, as of now I'm including. Um, large swaths of software that are not listed on on that list yep. Yep. and but they're very and and here's exactly what i did there are other um specialized linux distributions that i took inspiration from over mm -hmm. the years mentally preparing for this right so i was in a facebook group saying oh there's this cae linux computer-aided engineering linux that has all these amazing you know physics simulation platform and all this other stuff and i was thinking of trying to use that as a as a foundation that didn't happen there's another amazing ubuntu uh multimedia production suite called ubuntu studio 
Um, and so what I did is I looked at those and I found what I could ascertain was the most uh, stable and useful software in those. And I brought those into OSD Linux as well. So specifically, in addition to all these video production uh, tools we talked about, there's a number of audio and music production tools. Mm -hmm. And I, my feeling is that as we um, continue to, uh, 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 as the multimedia output of OSE continues to evolve, uh, <laughs> it would be nice to have some custom music in there too. And I have nice. been that like a lot of OSE developers have a ha, have music creation in their in their life in their background of their lives as well so yeah i've played around with a little bit there's a cool uh open source um music editor called Ard ardor yes yeah, so ardor yeah. is included as okay a, cool yeah yeah i've played around with that it's kind of fun and like uh like synthesizers and drum machines that can all be uh <laughs> used in, uh, in <laughs> concert with that and then from from cae linux I took in a few different software packages um, that have to do with um, digital simulation of physical objects. Like mm. there's this kind of newish concept called digital twins, where you have a, a digital replica of a physical object that is accurate down to the atomic level. That's crazy. And that then you can a lot basically power. have it do simulations. Um, and I, so the way that I learned about this too is kind of I did this kind of dragnet of the internet looking for all OSE software stuff that was going on. And there's now, you must be aware, Martin, there's an open source ecology Germany yeah. that's kind of t taking the ball and, and they're, they're kind of putting their own spin on it to some extent. Like it looks like they're putting more effort into electronic devices and things like that. Uh, like, more than just the sort of industrial hardware and production and, and agricultural production type. And w one thing that they did is they used one of these digital twin type software platforms to do a digital micro tractor. So. Oh, I haven't they, seen that. Yeah. So, so they have. You're not now, talking about oh, the gazebo simulation. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, gazebo. Oh, okay. That's that's from uh, some other guys, no? That's, that's from. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's some U.S. guys that did that. We were working on a, a remote control tractor project. Uh -huh. yeah. I, I somehow saw it through the through the open source ecology de was how okay, I found okay. it. So okay. I made that assumption. Okay. But um, I'll have to check that out. So the latest version of Gazebo is included as well. Okay, cool. And and some other some other software that's in that neighborhood um, that I don't really have expertise enough in to to. To, to brag about, and then the last, the, then the last big piece that I felt, uh, and we can remove any of this, but basically once we said we weren't going to have a four gigabyte limit, I was like, well, then it's an eight gigabyte limit, and I just figured I would, you know, get get a little more excited about this. Yeah. And so the last big element I added was a suite of GIS software, yep. geographic information systems, and hopefully, um, like. We have QGIS in there and Grass GIS. Oh, great! Yeah, yeah. And nice. that can help you for site for for you know for site planning and things like that. I think it could be useful. We have used uh, Q, QGIS. Uh, did you great. say ArcGIS is in there? No, no, no. Grass yeah. ArcGIS is Boku That's Bucks. The, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, if you want to take a look at the micro track in Gazebo, here's the link in the chat box. It's on the wiki, of, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. We we did um, not ArcGIS. I think it was QGIS. Yeah, QGIS. I mean, we have a land land use plan of of the facility here in QGIS. Did you inc you didn't include QGIS? You did Grass. I did. Yes, yeah. QGIS and Grass are both okay. included. They're both. Uh, from the OSGO Foundation, both of those softwares, so yeah. they're complementary. QGIS. That's great, because when we did that workshop, we had a live dis distro with QGIS on it, so now we can run it on OSC Linux. That's 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 really good, actually. So we can put it all into this one power pack. And then we can talk about dedicated Lini, <laughs> OSC Lini, that, that here's your construction 
uh, thing with that's dedicated to the construction world or of the seed home or whatever or tractor design or whatever so we can have custom distributions that facilitate a certain activity that's great mm -hmm. sure yeah but this is going to be kind of like the, the kitchen sink everything in the kitchen sink <laughs> okay well that's good that sounds good well if we uh if we were to have actually good instructionals on how to like get rapid proficiency in a lot of these things that would be really good i could envision where i mean a big part of it is simply downloading and installing everything right so that's a great plus to making this much more accessible to more people so that's that's a great step and then in the future we can talk about okay now here's some really good tight instructionals where we onboard people really quickly to being decently proficient like 80 20 rule uh, and a lot of these pieces of software so that would be great mm -hmm. yeah i mean I, I really like the work that you've done around uh pre-cad and the, uh, um providing those tutorials i've been uh just to sort of um quality you know assurance like i was like let me try actually besides just opening this software and seeing that it's open like actually do something with it right uh, and so i have been able to use freecad 0 0.16 and 0 0.18 in those ways um on the yeah. on the distribution so far so i'm doing good That's about awesome. that yeah so gee is once we have what ray is capable of doing on conda and, and the whole workbench platform how much how much effort does it take now for a person to to do the full install and start going on a workbench platform maybe you can fill in a little bit yeah sure i mean it's basically uh like what we just talked about so if you go to the readme there's like one or two commands that you run and then you have it installed mm -hmm. and if you wanted to just like get up and running with like a new workbench it's like another just one command and then you're you're kind of off and running and you can uh essentially there's a workbench and um you'll specify the name of it like the tractor workbench or the uh, ceb press workbench and then you get a little button you click it and it adds a box on the screen and then you can kind of just tweak that code however you like so that's we have that already and so so you're working in now on on all the documentation for how how to navigate all of that or Tell me yeah, so the, doc the documentation is pretty much there, uh, at least the written documentation, but okay. I was still working on a, a video tutorial style series where I make it a little bit more accessible and then I can kind of fill in um, a little bit more information, you know, through talking than I could in, in a written context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, can I ask a, a little bit more about that process? Um, what? So, I mean, obviously you're using Conda, so, and I, my understanding is all those pre-CAD, every type of mod or, or, or plugin or whatever is written in Python, is that correct? Um, it's a mixture of Python and C++, but like as far as the code that we're writing, it's purely Python. I see, I see. And then, so what is, what is that uh, workbench plugin develop or workbench development process look like? Is that... Like I, I saw that I saw I checked out some of your videos. I saw that you are using VS Code. Yep. So you're, I would imagine you're writing. Um, if you if you're using a workbench platform, does that kind of give you a project to open in VS Code, like a like a template, or how? What does that ex actually look like? Yeah. So um, the workbench kind of includes, or the platform kind of includes a, a workbench template to kind of get you started. Um, but it also, I, I don't know if you have like a, like what your background is, if you're kind of familiar with software development at all, but um, the idea is that like uh, it, it's trying to standardize and, and do those common development time tasks like, you know, running unit tests or, you know, how are the, is the documentation structured, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and it kind of provides patterns for, you know, how to do that with FreeCAD and Workbenches. Um, yeah, so. that's kind of, I guess that's what I'm really wondering about is how do you develop this? Th how do you see this thing? Do you see this thing in FreeCAD while you're developing? Uh, yeah, so it's kind of a pain in the butt, but you have to make your code changes in the editor VS Code, and then uh, you have to start up FreeCAD, and then uh, you test your changes, and you got to quit out of FreeCAD and stop it. Uh, and then, 
I understand. There's no live reloading when there are changes in the in the in the workbench. Yeah, that'd be really cool if someone figured that out though. <laughs> if you're watching this, please figure that out. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. I mean that would they'll get a lot more workbenches out of that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. Sure. Um when would you want me to test that? Like like let's see, like I would think that after you have the videos, maybe I can take a look at it and test, actually do do a sample exercise. So like when we, when we talked about an initial meeting of trying to design a simple workbench, uh, can I take it with from there and maybe be the first tester? Yeah, I'm looking for guinea pigs. I mean, I have enough videos up there on YouTube right now in the series to where uh, you could start with installing the platform, getting set up with VS Code as your editor, and then mm -hmm. um, creating a, a button that just when you click it, create or sorry, it's a it's a nut, hexagonal nut. That reminded me, I can pre-install VS Code as well. Yeah, that would be good. Um, thank you for saying that because I totally forgot that. I was going to put Atom, but I'm totally happy to use VS Code. They're, it's all Microsoft now that Microsoft for GitHub. So right. <laughs> they, they have the last say on both of those code editors, so I'll, I'll just add VS Code. Cool. And then there are some plugins I see that you talked about in VS Code as well uh, mm -hmm. in tutorials. You think I should just follow all those and configure VS Code the way that you uh, described? Um, yeah, if you want to do that um, or leave it up to the person to do it, I think either is fine. Okay, I'll do what I can. Uh, the way that I'm the, the way that I'm building OSC Linux 2.0, everything has to have My name is G, and to it's like a ch root environment. Like I so and I can't do anything and that involves opening the program in a graphical user case. It would probably be easier for just the user to go ahead and install like those extensions themselves than try and do it in a command line way. Yeah, I'll, I'll look. I won't try too hard then. Okay. Comes down <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, hmm. Okay. Well, you got a bunch of videos here. Yeah. Yeah. I've been trying to kind of make them in little small bites just a, a few minutes per video is kind of my goal okay let's see how many more were you looking at making um uh, maybe like five or ten maybe I'm not too sure yet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's been a little ad hoc okay hmm. let's see visual Installing Visual Studio, so for example, so Ray, for example, you have Visual Studio Code on your list. Is that going to be in OS e Linux? Yes, I'll go ahead and add that. I mean, most of these programs are like you know ten megabytes or something, and that's before we compress it. So mm -hmm. adding any one additional program to me is is totally acceptable at this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Ray, you have a good idea of all the. I mean, do you feel you got a pretty much a full handle of all the items that, from G side, that that you would need to install, or is there any ambiguity there? Or? No, no. The the questions I asked those are really my main questions about okay. the, the, the plugins and stuff. That's good. That's awesome. Um, maybe um, maybe I should wait for the the OSC Linux to to actually do the test, and that way we can. Um, Iron out any rough edges in it, and that too. And then we then it'll be something that's replicable to others. Like I, I'm not just doing this on my computer, but actually teaching in a way or learning for the purpose of teaching more effectively because everyone will have the same environment. So that's probably probably a good idea. And since that's so a couple of weeks, I should probably do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can honestly try to have this uh, latest version up on that website that we've been using tonight for you to, for you to download. Okay. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, with all the changes that we talked about today? Yes. Oh, great. Right. Yeah, so, everything okay. is in there except for start VS Code with. at this point, so okay. I should be able to get that done. Excellent, excellent. So, yeah, I can start taking a look at that. As far as the longer-term longer, longer term plan, like the, the big deal for, for next year is... Uh, you guys have, might have heard about the Seed Home Next Iteration and an ambitious project on that. But 
the workbench I'm it would be ideal if we could get the the modules for the seat home into the workbench and make that part of the release uh, the product release when we when we do the seat home uh, version so people are actually we're inviting a number of people into the extreme enterprise event to work on that and you know don't know how far we would get but but at least um, people having the, the the workbench platform available in OSE OSE Linux uh, being able to work with that and at least get started some somewhat so between doing things like in FreeCAD like extracting bills and materials through the the spreadsheet function also in Sweet Home 3D um, doing renderings and visualizations also using so using part libraries both in Sweet Home and FreeCAD we could get quite a quite far in a, in a decent design capacity for for iterations of the seed home for people to design themselves on, on different iterations of it so that's that's really good um, so I think that I mean that's realistically so I guess for me the best thing I could do to get that going is try to um, learn learn the platform as quickly as possible so so we can see what exactly the limits of that would be for people's ability to learn it if I can yeah. learn it I can um, gauge much better uh, how quickly others can learn it yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Well, well, I'd, I'd be excited to, to try to participate in that project as well because I, I I do have a lot of Python programming experience. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I've never never done plugin for FreeCAD before, but I mean, hopefully I can figure out the missing pieces. Yeah. Yeah. That's the idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Definitely. Um, gee, what, how much time do you think like a person who's you know, kind of like at my skill level or whatever, just basic literacy um, and these kinds of things. How long would it take to go to to get, say, the exercise of creating the nut or creating your first part? How long, how long do you think that would take for a person to do? Um, well, if you, follow, if you follow my my video series, I mean, mm -hmm. you could probably get that done in like a day or two over a weekend. Hmm. That's awesome. Cool. That's awesome. And then. Yeah, hopefully, like, um, I, I do make a lot of assumptions, like, I'm kind of assuming that you're somewhat familiar with Python or, you know, assuming that you're somewhat familiar with software development. So I, I'm not, I didn't really tailor the, the series to people who weren't, like, already familiar with those topics because there's yeah. lots of good resources out there on those topics already. Yep. As far as um, creating a geometry from scratch, so your current tutorial, does that cover up to that? Like what you said, the nut, is that created from scratch? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you kind of create this like three-dimensional hexagonal prism, and then you create a cylinder, and then you cut the cylinder from the uh, hexagonal prism to create the nut. And I kind of talk about like how to think about that and where to go look for you know more information on how to do that. and. Um, Hopefully it's helpful. You'll have to let me know when you do it. Yeah, yeah, no. So just, just to kind of have a heads up of what the state of it is. So, for example, if I understand how to go through the process with a nut, then using existing uh, tutorials, I can create another part and add yeah, that yeah. Like drag and drop, uh, click and drop element into the into the interface. Totally, yeah. That's the other thing I was going to uh, plan on adding was I was going to add a bolt just just to get a little bit more practice. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then I was thinking about like doing some alignment stuff, you know, where you could click like a, you know, where a hole was cut out in some part, and then you know maybe like align the the bolt in the hole. But I'm not sure that that kind of seems more advanced. Um, yeah. So I'm at present, you know. when you when you drag and drop something into the the view screen, can you do things like, for example, define the exact location uh, for that click? So whenever the person clicks it gets put somewhere outside of like say zero zero um like you could define that but like to make that dynamic uh to where like you know you select something and then click it and then that's where the part goes like that's going to require you know more programming mm -hmm. complication there so uh that's the part i was unsure about including or not because i know you can use the 
you know, move and yeah. uh, rotate tools with the draft workbench. So I figured just, you know, learning how to create those part geometries was going to be pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think the phase one, if we can create the part geometries that we can drop into the workspace, yeah, that's a great level one platform to start with. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, if you can pretty much get all the engineering detail with a click of a button, yeah, that's that's really powerful already. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right. Well, that sounds good. I look forward to doing it. So I think so. It sounds like uh, that's that's pretty successful. We can. Uh, I want to see how how I do at it, but it sounds like what what, I, what you wanted to achieve. I think you got all all done, right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, um, yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let, let's see. Uh, let's see how the user feedback. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm waiting on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let me know, and I'll, and I'll, I'll just. I saw uh, Beck's little uh, video, his little promo, five minutes with the open source ecology. Yeah. Background and like the yellow metal, and it looked yeah. pretty cool. I got to up my my video quality. <laughs> well, I'm trying to extract the know-how from him on how to do that. He did the nice demo, but so far we we don't have an instructional for exactly how to do that. So yeah, I would love to know how to. Like, you know, do that and I, so you know, I, software I, that. Yeah, yeah. Funnily enough, at my day job, I've been learning a lot about OBS. Yeah. So OBS has the green screen function built in. You just need to have. Uh, it doesn't need to be a green screen either. It just needs to be a uniform color behind you, that's evenly lit, that doesn't match the color of you in any way or what you're wearing. Then you can use like. Um, if Beck can't do it, you could probably convince me to do a five-minute tutorial on how to set it all well, up. Well, I mean, I mean, let's let's touch back with Beck because he hasn't he hasn't responded. I asked him, "Hey, can you do a video, or can you just at least uh, submit some of those assets, like the the Blender image and the P, you know whatever?" Yeah, three D logo thing, the perspective three D logo. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we need our hands on that for sure. But yeah, we do want to. I'd I'd like to get a good instructional on. Uh, I, I guess that combines, I guess, Caden Live with OBS uh, on how to do that. So, I mean, if we have a standard procedure, just a very well refined workflow how, for how to do that, we can really up the up the game on how we produce our videos. Like, it could even be, well, if we can do that as an intro screen, uh, that's literally like a cut, a thing that you cut and paste into all your videos. As yeah, your like intro. a bumper or whatever they call it. They have a name for that. Like this. <laughs> and then the video <laughs> there you yeah. go. Then yeah. we, can, we can get the excitement of the OSC FreeCAD workbench with our whatever you call it. <laughs> the bumper. <laughs> Is this bumper? Or, 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 don't quote me on it. <laughs> Why do you think it's called bumper? That's what I think it's called okay. for my years right. and years of new. <laughs> and then we get into exo the exotic details of coding <laughs> right <Okay>. after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to spice up life a little bit. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, yeah, one other thing about OBS. Um, I, there are some other plugins that are that are popular for OBS. One is I don't really know what they do exactly. Uh, but one is a WebSockets plugin. Do you have? To, does that ring a bell for you at all? Not for me. Okay. Uh, not... I, I don't know what it would do in the context of video making, but that's a technology for like you know bi-directional communication of something. I don't know what in the context of OBS that would be for, but yeah. Um, and then there's another one called NVI, which I'm going to probably add as well. A plugin, which has to do with letting you use. Android and iOS devices like external cam cameras feeding into OBS. Okay. So that that can that is really a bell and whistle at this point. I'm going to try to get that in there. If I can't, I feel bad. Um, Do we know that, anything about like? Because uh, I thought about like after that video with Beck, I, I got pretty inspired. I was thinking like, wow, look at all the different feeds we can get into OBS. Like, imagine you have a drone. And then you're feeding that as like, say we're doing a, one of our workshops on construction and we just, okay, here, look at the drone picture right now. Oh, uh, that would be really um, cool. Is there any or, insight on how to do that? Or is um, that capacity, like how would we do that within OBS right now? Like, Yeah. Um, so no. NDI is the one, NDI is this company that's been around way before, like for, they're actually the company that made the video toaster. They used to run on Amigas. 
back at, in like the turn of the millennium. And now they do, uh, they created this um, protocol, NDIHX, that is used to, it was initially used to transmit production quality video across um, ethernet cables. So like that was the original use case was like here, if you're, a new way for you to wire up your video production studio, use ethernet cables, which are a commodity thing, um, and use this gigabit ethernet protocol to do that. They've since extended that to work over with, with Wi-Fi devices as well. And now you can get um, apps from the iOS app, from the, I, the app stores for the, the, the platforms, for mobile platforms, that let, let it serve as a camera that speaks this NDI HX protocol. And then um, OBS needs a plugin to be able to receive that. So I don't know exactly like uh, what the standards are around the cameras and the broadcasting of cameras on the drones. Um, but my feeling is uh, most of the time, if you can get it into the computer real time, there's probably going to be a way or we could build a way to get it into the computer and into OBS too. Yeah. Okay. So if, if it's not already out there, I think um, we could probably make it happen. Doesn't... Um... So Arju Pilot doesn't have like a real viewing, real time viewing of from. Let's see, Arju Pilot. Is that the Arduino? I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, that's drone. like open source drone software. Arju Pilot. Um, cool. Live feed to computer. Let's see. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's kind of the I don't know, but if you if you want to look into um, right, if you want to Google that a little bit and see if there's any useful tools that can get us closer to that, uh, that would be useful. We haven't done 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 much of the drone work yet, so but I mean the drone, it's um, that's kind of low hanging fruit technology to to do some exciting video input. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so. Yeah, I have Arduinos. I don't have a drone, <laughs> but uh, maybe there's a way I can make just the video functionality with an Arduino and try to see if I can get it working with OBS. Do you have an Arduino camera? No, but I mean, I can obtain something like that. I have a few bucks to spend on this, so... Um, yeah, see if you can do that, because in that case, if you have a Wi-Fi module from your Arduino, I mean, is there any issue, like, what, say when you're flying a drone, is, like, does the standard simple Wi-Fi protocol get disrupted by flying a drone? Because, I mean, the simplest case is you get your Arduino with your Wi-Fi and with your little camera and just slap it on a drone without even anything special, without... What, what kind of altitude do you typically fly this drone at for, to capture what's going on well, on the ground? If, yeah, to make it practical, like, you want to go up, like, say, like, 100 feet or so. I think, well, so yeah, if you have a Wi-Fi access point that's like nearby, like right there, mm -hmm. and you send the drone up, I'm pretty sure it'll be fine. You might have to use like an older protocol, like 2.4G versus 5G, not 5G like mobile, but like 5 gigahertz, 2.4 gigahertz uh, frequency band. Longer distance. It's the, yeah, it's a, the, exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think it's, it's probably doable. Yeah. <laughs> well, can maybe start this at this time around for the LSE Linux 2.0. We'll see. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely look into the Arch and Pop stuff and see if I can put together some kind of land, you know, yeah, grounded, like prototype. Yeah. It doesn't like doesn't fly. <laughs> I'm flying prototype. <laughs> yeah, a non-flying drone. Arch, Arch, Arch. <laughs> Well, that's useful in itself because you know you can use that as remote monitoring right there, too. So, yeah. Say so you got your, you know, we got your local network and we've got internet in other buildings. I mean, yeah, you can do that for remote monitoring things. Like, like for example, use case right now. Like, say we've got a workshop. In the workshop, you can put a bunch of those different cameras and from different viewpoints that you can then select. 
or through OBS then control like okay here's our control room uh, for say we're broadcasting a live event you know That'll right be and you could exciting. do live AB, AB switching in OBS studio between all those sources yeah 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 you uh, can make a really professional looking video with that yeah yeah, yeah. no that's after talking the, the back conversation and my mind was spinning I'm like man that's <laughs> It's a lot of possibility. Is there a limit to the number of inputs with an OBS, or is it like? Um, I would guess it's kind of like a hardware constraint, like the, the like the RAM and the CPU of your mm -hmm. computer is going to dictate the limit. Mm -hmm. If we had like, do you have any feeling for if we had say live camera sources, how many could be accepted without a problem? ones that are, say, connected directly to your computer? Uh, where, do you mean a, a, a wired or wireless connection? Either. Either, like, yeah. <laughs> um, wired. I think, I, I, I don't really know. I would pull, I don't know, five, between five and ten, maybe, if you're, yeah. if you're, if you're working with, a, you know, like a standard definition screens. Mm -hmm. I would give you my, like, you know, just off-the-cuff guess. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's really a question of bottlenecks. Whether it's if you're using Wi-Fi, then really how much can, how much can you send over your Wi-Fi network at the same time, and how much can your uh, yeah. Wi-Fi and receiver pick up? Yep, yep, yeah. Because we do have a fat pipe here, so we we have one gig right here. So we can like for the next workshop, like talking about next year, if we can beef up some of this infrastructure, we could get some good feeds coming in from our live events. Which we you know we did a marginal job so far, but yeah, we can up our game on that. So hopefully we move a little bit towards that way. Oh, yeah. So you're saying yeah. literally events happening in multiple geographic locations. Well, if, yeah, yeah, I mean, you could do that. But <laughs> but for now, I was, just, I was just saying, since we got a good good internet connection here, just multiple, just switching between different activities, like even in the workshop, there's multiple parts being done at the same time. So you're switching between all of them. and switching into the classroom or if it's a build workshop going to your aerials and whatever or, or field tests you know so yeah yeah could be so very interesting the reason i got a little confused is because the the um the bottlenecks when i say that there's going to be like if you're using wi-fi and there's bottlenecks that's not going to be a question of your of your pipe to the internet that's going to be a question of your local area network and mm -hmm. and the, the capacity of your local area network yeah yeah. Um, and I don't know to what extent you're. Do you have? Uh, we have hard lines going down, like from one one side of the the place to the other. So, yeah, we could do different buildings on a good connection, on a good landline, good physical line. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So that's really good. Yeah, I think that some of that though, I think we're just gonna it's gonna bear out in testing. Oh, like yeah. Once you oh, have yeah. three or four or five sources, then you're gonna really find out how well it works. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. You know? Yeah. No, that's really awesome. Good. Well, I'm glad we have the kitchen sink in there. So yeah. uh, <laughs> we'll play with it. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. it really, it, it's just turning into what I think is gonna be every every creator's dream OS. That's what I really. Oh, nice. That, that's really what became. In my head, after a while, once I went off the list that you had, and then, like I said, took the inspiration from the other specialized Linai, I could call them. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, like I, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, there's a lot for me to go off of, and I'll go and get add those last pieces of software. I'll spin up the spin off the latest ISO, and I'll upload it. And March, and I'll email you when it's ready to look at. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, thank you. And then, gee, as far as uh, following the works, I guess looking at the nut example, if I can follow those instructionals to that, that would be my first my first test case, and replicate yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll see if I can do that. Let's see cool. how quickly I can. Get yeah. Through. Let me know if you hit any snags. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, that sounds good. So I, th I, think <laughs> I think we're good for now then yeah cool yeah well right so yeah thanks a lot for doing that and gee yeah look forward to the workbench for many people using that and we'll go from there yeah looking forward to trying out OSC Linux 2.0 and it was great meeting you Ray good talk to you again Marchin okay take Absolutely. care guys take care all thanks. thank you <laughs>